Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Live at 5, I have the incredible story of Detroit police watching and listening to police impersonators from the victim's cell phone. All right, Sean, also tackling America's opioid epidemic, our special coverage shining a light on everything from the dangers of fentanyl to the innocent victims who've been caught in the middle. But we begin with the devastating impact of Hurricane Irma. And that is the sound of 185 mile per hour winds slamming St. Martin as this historic storm takes aim at the Florida coast. Here is a live look at St. Croix, where it seems uh, that small island did not see the worst of the storm. Uh, it's passed through that area as it now continues its way westward. The storm video, though, that you saw from St. Martin, just a taste of what could hit Florida if Irma's track holds. Right, so many people with loved yeah. ones in the storm's path are now hopefully in the process of packing up and getting to safety. Ben got a look at uh, brand new data from tracking the storm. It looks like South Florida is uh, in the bullseye here. It really is. In every six hours, we keep looking at this data, hoping something will change and unfortunately the situation just gets more dire for South Florida. So let's look at the five o'clock advisory. This is just in from the Hurricane Center. Still 185 mile an hour winds category five storm. This is now the strongest hurricane in the Atlantic Basin outside of the Gulf and the Caribbean and the track very similar to what we've seen from the previous forecast likely tearing through the Turks and Caicos here very early on Friday morning, still at a cat five weakening somewhat as it heads towards Florida. But right at this point is when this storm is going to start to turn. But Unfortunately, the center of this forecast track has it right on top of Miami Sunday. This is earlier than what we have been seeing. This is Sunday afternoon just after lunchtime. Still almost 150 mile an hour winds at a cat four and beyond this very similar eerily similar uh, to past hurricanes that have just raked the east coast of Florida possibly could make a second landfall in the Carolinas still as a major hurricane and this is by Monday at two o'clock with 120 mile an hour winds. So folks all over the south making preparations, especially in South Florida. Take a look at what happened earlier as Irma tore through the Caribbean. The first strike overnight on the island of Barbuda. The wind, the rain, everything is going into that direction. Sheets of rain and wind and recorded wind gusts of 155 miles an hour as Hurricane Irma chewed through the Virgin Islands, heading just north of Puerto Rico, leaving destruction and flooding in its wake. The storm now considered the strongest on record ever in the Atlantic, a massive monster of a storm on a collision course with Florida. The storm is bigger, faster and stronger than Hurricane Andrew. A storm of this size could have effect statewide and everybody should be prepared. Evacuations are underway in the Florida Keys and millions across the state are heeding the dire warnings, boarding up and stocking up, leaving some shelves bare. A run on supplies leading to long lines at the pumps. Some stations temporarily out of gas. And at a hardware store, plywood is at a premium. It's getting low. I mean, stores look. in the governor promising more is on the way. You visited the store yesterday and found a shortage. You should go back today to get your supplies once everything has been replenished. Filling carts and sandbags in preparation. That's the nice thing about a hurricane. Like, you can prepare for a long period of time before time starts to run out. And that is probably the only saving grace with Irma as we have had days to prepare. It is still looking like the worst case scenarios could come true. By the way, on the other side of Irma, this is Jose. This is now a hurricane. This is also forecasted to become a major hurricane. The center of the forecast cone barely brushes some of the Leeward Islands, but some of the same places that got just pummeled today may have to do it again with Jose in just a few days. All right, Ben, we will get back to you shortly, but uh, some breaking news to get to right now. Detroit International Bridge Company owner and billionaire Matty Maroon is saying that he now has the final approval he needs to build a second span for the Ambassador Bridge, not the Gordie Howe Bridge. This would be a second span of the Ambassador. According to Maroon, the proposed $500 million project would not cost a dime to taxpayers on either side of the river. The bridge would bring traffic between borders down significantly, as you'd imagine. It would consist of six lanes stretching over 2,000 feet long. In a statement, the Canadian government says the approval is subject to conditions, and now Governor Snyder is saying Maroon still needs U.S. approvals before construction can start. 
Our other top story tonight, a woman is robbed late last night by a group posing as Detroit police officers. Happened around 1045 near the intersection of Fort and Junction in southwest Detroit. That's just part of the story. Sean Lay live with us now, and uh, he's going to show us how the victim was able to turn the tables on the robbers. Sean? turn the tables big time. This is remarkable, Devin and Kimberly. Good evening. This woman was able to watch these robbers after the robbery. Watch along with Detroit police from an app she installed on her phone. Watch and listen. In fact, after the robbery, these guys said they were hungry and headed right here to this McDonald's. They had no idea. Police were tracking their every move. I've heard about it on some of those uh, reality TV shows but I've never actually in application heard anybody who had it. Detroit Police Commander Whitney Walton says it was incredible. Last night, Detroit police were able to watch and listen to some men impersonating Detroit police moments after they stole the woman's cell phone here at Junction and Fort last night. The woman and her fiance came to the 4th Precinct. They opened up an app on the fiance's phone. And from there, investigators could watch and listen to every move those impersonators were making. She opened up the app on her phone and he said it was incredible that they could clearly hear everything that was going on and they were tracking the robbers. At one point, they talked about going to a fast food restaurant to eat. Moments later, police were able to track the men to this McDonald's on Michigan Avenue. The men had a badge in their car and they had other cell phones. It turns out police have been looking for these guys for other similar robberies. It was very helpful to the police. Extremely helpful. The victim tells me tonight the software that she put on her phone is called a tracker. They're available online. She walks to work and her fiance can keep an eye on her that way from his phone. It opens the camera and microphone letting the person on the other end, in this case police, watch and listen. Watching and listening and they said it was as clear as a bell. Back here live. Police think there are more victims out there. They would like to come forward. These guys were in a red Chevy Cruiser. They think uh, they were approached or victimized by these guys. Please call police. Devin, they caught two of the guys last night. They're still looking for a third right now. Sean, this will no doubt generate some interest in these kinds of apps, but I am curious. It, it, what if the phone is turned off by whoever takes it? What happens with the app? We there? asked this. We asked the same thing. So you have to have it on one phone and then on the other yeah. phone. So if the other phone is turned off, the other person fires it up on their phone. That opens the camera on that phone, allowing uh, the other person to watch and listen. Wild. Kind of remote control. Amazing stuff. All right, Sean. All right. Kim? Pretty interesting. All right, now to brand new information. We're learning into multiple raids this morning by Michigan State Police and the DEA in both Taylor and Detroit. Jason Colthorpe is following this story for us tonight. Jason, these raids aren't connected to just one case here. No, four altogether, Kim, but uh, Detroit police and state police being very tight lipped about these raids this morning, not even confirming which three homicides they're tied to or which uh, carjacking it is also tied to. And I, I can also tell you that state police wanted to run these raids this morning under the cover of darkness without any media attention. But unfortunately, now word got out and they'll have to s try and solve three Detroit murders with a lot of extra eyes. Five raids in the early morning hours, four in Detroit and one in Taylor. This one going off just after 6 a.m. on Allendale, just off the I-96 service drive. The state police major case unit, along with the Detroit Homicide Task Force, in heavy body armor here, executing these search warrants. Five people total were arrested, all in connection with three recent homicides and a carjacking. Evidence was collected and other people were detained in cuffs before being released just after 11 a.m. Now that major case unit will try to piece together the evidence to see if these murders are linked, if they have everyone involved, and if these houses and these crimes are connected. Now, there were several people in the home on Allendale here, here when it was raided. Not, not all of them arrested. The ones that were left behind, as soon as police cleared the scene around 11 a.m., they scattered. Two of them on foot, two more in a car grabbing clothes, even a TV, before heading out of town in a real big hurry. We'll be following this story clearly as it unfolds to see what charges and what murders these are linked to. Back to you. Okay, Jason, we appreciate it.
One man was shot and wounded this morning during an armed robbery in southwest Detroit. Neighbors tell Local 4 they heard gunshots about 6 o'clock this morning on Navy Street near Verner and Spring Wells. And when police arrived, they found a man who had been shot in the foot. He is recovering in the hospital. Uh, we await word on arrests in the case. It was back to school yesterday for Melvindale High School students and then back home this morning. A natural gas leak prompted the early dismissal of classes at the school. Students were dismissed at about 930 this morning as work continued to contain and stop the leak in the school building. No injuries reported, though, and classes are expected to resume tomorrow. Local 4 News at 5 just getting started today. We have a lot more coming up in this next hour, including why tonight may be the perfect chance to see the northern lights and why you will see a whole bunch of military equipment this week in downtown Detroit. And wait till you see what's inside. New at 5, we're taking you on the first tour of the new Little Caesars Arena. Good evening, everybody. I'm Defender Karen Drew here in the Local 4 phone bank as we tackle America's opioid epidemic head on. We are here with addiction experts answering your questions. Up next, I'm going to show you one of the most dangerous drug in this whole epidemic. New at six. A family pet stabbed by a home invader. I'm pretty devastated. I can't cry anymore because I've cried enough. Live at 6, what happened to Gracie the dog? And we'll tell you about her long road to recovery. When Kid Rock opens up the new arena next week, a protest out here on Woodward Avenue will be part of the scene. And now a boycott called for today. I'll explain. Demick. The opioid crisis is an American epidemic, and one of the biggest problems is the use of fentanyl. It is exponentially more potent than heroin, and just this tiny amount right here is all it takes to kill you. Defender Karen Drew joins us now from our phone bank where addiction experts are standing by. Talk about more about fentanyl and its big impact on the opioid epidemic. Karen? The issue on fentanyl is so very serious. I'll get to that in one second, but first, our phone bank is open right now. Experts are taking your addiction questions. So call the number on your screen, 844-WDIV-HELP. Now, back to fentanyl. It is a synthetic opioid prescribed by doctors to treat chronic pain for cancer patients. But fentanyl is being sold on the streets, and it is so very dangerous. It can be absorbed through the skin, it can be inhaled if airborne, and the smallest amount can be deadly. Playing with her son's dog, Java, seeing his talent framed on the walls of her home, Vicki King has constant reminders of who her son could have been. Had an eye for the camera. And I don't think he realized how good he was, and he loved it. But then when things started getting bad, that passion started to fizzle away. Vicki says Jeff was a good kid. She never thought he would become addicted to opioids. Two years after his death, she still wonders how he started down that path. He had a snowboard injury, and he broke his arm, pulled off his rotator cuff, he dislocated his shoulder, had some major surgery done, and he was probably about 15 or 16 at that time. But I don't know if that's what triggered it. As he finished high school, grades were slipping. Stories weren't adding up, but Vicki just thought her son was being a teenager. He went away to Wayne State University, then she got a major wake-up call. Found him in my, the emergency room at Beaumont. And he was there for an overdose. Vicki and her family got her son into recovery, but it was short-lived. Her son overdosed on heroin, laced with fentanyl. He was just 20 years old. I don't know if I've ever seen anything in my career that's more significant than the fentanyl. Timothy Planson is on the front lines of the opioid battle, overseeing the Drug Enforcement Agency's efforts to combat the crisis in Michigan, Ohio, and Kentucky. He says heroin laced with fentanyl is smuggled in from Mexico, but fentanyl is also being ordered online and shipped in from China. Fentanyl, about the equivalent of about two, three, four grains of salt could kill you. It's not just mixed with heroin anymore. Some people are taking cocaine laced with fentanyl because they think it's less addictive. It's not. Others are just taking fentanyl. Agents are seeing the drug on the street as liquids, powders, and pills. The chemical stuff, or pure fire, are names the DEA says people are using to get it. It's dangerous for everybody involved. 
Now you're going to hear more about fentanyl tonight at 10 o'clock during our primetime special. And I'm going to show you what Border Patrol is doing to stop opioid abuse. We actually ride along with them. Now right now you can talk to an addiction expert in our phone bank. Once we put that number on the screen, I have to tell you every line just rang up. So obviously there are some people there that really need this help. If it's busy, call again, 844-WDIV-HELP. I'm Karen Drew, back to you. Also, online, right now we have experts here, as we said, to answer your questions in a web chat, and that's going on at clickondetroit.com. For now, we'll set it back to you. Devin, Kim? Oh, the four grains of salt that equivalent. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, our co special coverage of America's opioid epidemic is really just getting started. Ahead here at 5.30, a man charged today in connection to a deadly fentanyl overdose. At 5.45, we're going to show you how innocent children are getting caught up in the middle of America's addiction to opioids. Then at 6 o'clock, Dr. Frank George shows us how there is hope for recovery. So stay with us. A lot more to come. Well, if you missed them back in July, the Northern Lights could be dancing tonight in the Michigan skies. Yeah, this is kind of exciting. Yeah. The northern part of the United States could see an Aurora Borealis show overnight Wednesday going into Thursday morning. And yes, that includes us right here in Michigan. It's all due to a solar flare that erupted from the sun on Labor Day. If you plan on seeing the show, you might have to go for a drive, though. Scientists recommend rural areas where it's completely dark. We'd recommend about 1130, no earlier than that. That's right. you got to watch around. the 11 o'clock exactly news. Exactly right. As soon That's as right. we're done, you can head out. <laughs> and this scientist would recommend Mackinac. I mean, you're going to have <laughs> to go yeah, right, that, yeah, right really the bridge. That's the way to see it, isn't it? Yeah. There's just a slight chance we could see it here. Yeah. Peek your head out and see, but don't count. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, we are really focused on Irma. Uh -huh. Boy, it's, uh, well, now the biggest storm ever seen in the Atlantic, right? It really yeah. is. And let's hope that the fact that we've been able to track this for days and what's happened with Harvey has really sort of driven the point home with folks who are living in South Florida to really heed all of the evacuation requests and, and mandates uh, that are going to be coming out of there in the next few days. This is the latest look at Irma. This is the radar presentation because because uh, Puerto Rico is right here. That's the uh, U.S. territory. We've got the radar 88D that's there on uh, the island, and that's what's able to give us that uh, uh, radar shot. And you can see that's a very symmetrical eye, a very intense eye wall around that Category 5 storm. The good news is it is starting to pull away very slowly from Puerto Rico. But even though it's not going to have a direct hit, hurricane force winds still will be brushing uh, the northern side of Puerto Rico here in the next few hours. We have a look. This is an actual measurements of wind speeds. And uh, even though those don't look all that impressive right now, there's a lot of spots uh, where the hurricane has actually taken out the instruments. So uh, our only measurements may be what we can glean from radar and satellite as this storm passes. In fact, this is the actual Doppler wind field, and it is measuring 165 miles an hour. Now, that's several thousand feet in the air at that point away from the radar site. But it's still a good indication of just how much strength and power is there in Irma. I wanted to show you the computer models real quick. Uh, very clustered together in the early part of this forecast. They all make that northerly turn at almost the same time. And a lot of clusters bring the core of the storm just off the coast of Florida. Now, the reason that the Hurricane Center forecast is keeping this a little bit further to the west, which you don't see here, because the Europeans won't give it to us, is the European model. Uh, and that has really been on the outside envelope of all of these model forecasts uh, pretty much since Irma has formed. And they're giving a little bit of respect to that computer model because it's usually one of the best. So that's why the forecast is just off to the west of that. And you can see once we get into day five and six, how this is taking that right towards the Georgia and South Carolina border. And again, remarkable consistency that far out uh, where the core of that storm is going. So we'll have to watch that carefully. Chilly here is we're only in the 60s. We've got one more cool day to go. Got some showers out there. May see a couple rumbles of thunder here at home, but everything should be fading as the sun goes down tonight. We'll see another round of showers and thunderstorms tomorrow. Not looking for anything severe, and then we dry out pretty quickly as we head into the upcoming weekend. So temperatures tonight at 49. The showers coming to an end. Look at these highs because these are going to be the coolest that we have to contend with here for the foreseeable future. Mid 60s in the city, and we're really not going to see a whole lot of difference across the zones. Mid 60s in our south zone, slightly cooler once you get west to 275. And at least we're going to stay out of the 50s for <laughs> high temperatures tomorrow in the north zone. That's about the best thing we could say about yeah. that. But the numbers will come up and we'll get some sunshine back for the weekend. By the way, Irma's impacts for us could be on Tuesday and Wednesday. How about that? Could yeah. be headed this direction. Not a big storm. All right. Well, it looks like other lawyers are now getting involved. New tonight, why Russia wants to take the United States to court.
But first, two brazen robberies in just 24 hours. Both incidents have one big thing in common. We'll explain next. A man arrested after the robbery of a 7-Eleven in Livonia this morning may be linked to a similar robbery that took place Tuesday. Livonia police took a man into custody following the armed robbery of the 7-Eleven on 7 Mile and Inkster. He may be the same man who robbed a 7-Eleven yesterday morning at Schoolcraft and Inkster in Redford Township. Let's move on to Marine Week. Did you know that this is Marine Week in Detroit? Uh, Marine Week kicks off the sea, the, or today, earlier today, an annual celebration that tries to connect the community with the United States Marines. Approximately 700 Marines will descend on the city for the week-long celebration. It has uh, over 80 community activities. They're all free. They're open to the public. Festivities kick off today at 6 p.m. at Campus Marshes Park. Eighth annual Marine Week. And if you'd like to see the full lineup of activities, just visit clickondetroit.com. At 5.30. No, you are not looking at a spaceship. It is the inside of Little Caesars Arena. Detroit is going to be the proud owner of the finest arena in America. Yesterday, we gave you a little bit of a taste, but today we take you on the grand nickel tour. They are the innocent victims of America's opioid epidemic. Our special coverage continues as we explore how helpless children are getting caught in the middle of a vicious cycle. He's an accused heroin fentanyl dealer who has 39 prior failure to appear notices. Wait till you hear what the judge gave him for bond and his reaction. And again, as we head to break, a reminder, we have our addiction experts standing by right now to answer your questions about opioids and opioid addiction. The number to call is 844-WDIV-HELP. 844 WDIV help. They will be here until 6:30 tonight and we will be right back. Next wheel. Police say he sold a deadly dose of opioids. An accused drug dealer charged in the overdose death of a West Bloomfield woman. Two weeks ago, we brought you the story about a raid by West Bloomfield Police in Detroit. Uh, it began with an overdose and the death of a young woman, and police tracked the bad drugs to a house on the city's east side. That raid has led to charges for an alleged drug dealer who prosecutors say sold that deadly dose. Jason Colthorpe following the story and explains the charges here. Jason. Yeah, Devin, we're talking about distribution of a controlled substance, specifically fentanyl here, which drug dealers will use to cut their heroin, but sometimes it be can become a fatal dose. And that's exactly what happened here in the death of this West Bloomfield woman sparking this investigation. The charge is the delivery of a controlled substance causing death. 41-year-old Leroy Hardwick of Detroit arraigned today on charges he distributed fentanyl, a powerful drug normally used to treat cancer patients. But police say it was his heroin laced with fentanyl that led to the overdose death of a 26-year-old woman August 8th. Hardwick was arrested after his east side home was raided August 23rd. As the judge went through Hardwick's criminal past, a few things jumped out. 39 times, failure to in court for traffic tickets. Have you ever had a license, sir? No, ma'am. And you just keep driving? Well, I, I took care of all that. So you're able to hire your own attorney, though? You're supposed to have met me here. Hardwick told the judge his two children need him at home. I have two kids to stay with me now. My seven-year-old, my six-year-old. I just took in maybe last month. And their mother just basically abandoned them. So, working every day. This is... Uh, impact on my life. But 39 unanswered traffic citations plus a felony drug conviction in 2002 led the judge to hand down a whopper of a bond. I'm setting a bond in the amount of $1 million cash assurity plus a GPS tether. Conditions of this bond are as follows. You're going to have no contact with it. And you can see just how shocked he was once he got over that. His next words were, I can't afford a million dollars. And of course, obviously the judge taking this as serious as the rest of America is and probably also putting some stock into the fact that she didn't really think he was uh, likely to show up back in court given his history. Devin. Of course, uh, Jason, we're putting a very sharp focus on the opioid epidemic today. And this is a prime example, I think, of what police uh, have in front of them. What are they saying about this arrest? They call this a significant bust and the type of arrest that they're going to keep 
fighting and keep making no matter where it is and like we said this one started in West Bloomfield and led them to Detroit so yeah. they're going to great lengths to do that and just to to give you an example of how far reaching this is uh, we're waiting for the arraignment of a suspected heroin dealer today and I struck struck up a conversation in the courthouse with a man who turned out coincidentally to have a 25 year old son who died of a heroin yeah. overdose yeah. so I mean it is a crisis it's just not very hard to find right now is it all right yeah Karen all right, we are tracking the very latest with Irma just north of Puerto Rico right now. And the question at this hour is exactly how is the storm going to hit as Florida starts evacuations? It looks like Florida is going to get impacted some way. It's just a question of which part of Florida right. is going to get the direct hit of Irma. Uh, and when you look at this picture on satellite, it just looks more ominous uh, every hour. We take a look at this thing. Uh, this is the visible satellite, the brand new Go 16 that NASA put in place this year. So we really have never had this vantage point on a hurricane before. And when you zoom in, these are one minute photographs of Irma uh, that have been looped. You can see all the way to the sea floor. You can see how the, uh, the the eye wall is sort of scooped up there. Uh, just an impressive satellite presentation of a Category 5 storm. Here's uh, Puerto Rico. There's San Juan. So the eye is going to stay north of there. That's good news. But once it gets closer to us, here are the two players. We've got that trough over top of us that is keeping us cool. This Bermuda high is what's blocking Irma from going north. But as this trough lifts, that's going to allow the high to retreat, and that's when Irma starts taking the turn towards Florida, and that's why we have that 90-degree turn in the forecast track heading towards Miami. So we'll keep an eye on that. And by the way, this looks eerily similar to Hurricane Matthew. This is the path Matthew took last fall. It stayed just offshore as a Category 4, was more of a problem up here in the Carolinas, and the folks in Florida hope it's going to stay east of Matthew's track as it heads towards Florida. Guys? Let's move back to Harvey, Ben. House members in Texas are saying help is on the way after the House there passed their legis uh, legislation to provide emergency funding for Harvey response and recovery. Unanimous 419 uh, vote, nearly $8 billion in funds were approved, including nearly $7.5 billion for the FEMA relief fund. Residents across the Houston area, of course, face a very long, grueling path to recovery. Many families return to their homes demolished from Harvey, while parts of Houston are still flooded, and that's, of course, due to the controlled reservoir releases. Uh, the Congress acted today decisively and in, in, in a bipartisan way as Americans to come to the relief of the people of Texas. So the message today is very simple. Help is on the way. Congressional leaders say this is just the first of a series of relief bills, which will likely total more than $100 billion. And, of course, we don't know how much more relief is going to be needed, uh, given what we've got coming in the days ahead. A critical countdown for Congress now is they must make a decision on the program that shields young immigrants from deportation. Despite promising to revisit the issue if Congress doesn't act, 15 states and Washington, D.C., are suing the Trump administration for the decision to rescind the DACA program. The concern is that Congress is already saddled with a slew of issues to sort out, though top Republicans say they want to act on DACA. I think the president was right to give us the time we need to find that compromise. They came here to live in the shadows, and we're not denying them that opportunity to live in the shadows. Released a memo with an ominous message to DACA saying, quote, prepare for departure. Officials say this is standard language for anyone who lacks legal status. The White House may soon be hearing from Russian lawyers. The Kremlin says it will sue the United States over the closure of Russian consulates in the U.S. The threat of a lawsuit comes after the U.S. forced Russian diplomatic facilities to shut down in San Francisco, New York, and Washington, D.C. A White House spokesperson says the administration is confident in the legality of the closures. After years of anticipation, it's the moment many Metro Detroiters have been waiting for, the first real chance to see what is inside Little Caesars Arena, which we've watched take shape uh, downtown. Yesterday, they cut the ribbon, of course. Our business editor, Rob Maloney, got to check out what is inside Detroit's newest landmark. Welcome inside Little Caesars Arena. One of the first things you'll notice is that all four of the entrances are sponsored. You get Meyer down there, Comerica here. Wide expanses, lots of restaurants, bronze statues. This is Alex Del Vecchio here. But some of the really neat amenities start at your feet, like this. Custom manhole covers with names like Stevie Eiserman, 
You can't miss the attention to heritage here. This is the original Olympia Stadium sign. There are glass cases with great memories like Rip Hamilton's clear mask, game-worn jerseys, old game-used hockey sticks, important trophies. But they look to the future too. The TV studio is state-of-the-art high definition with 69 camera positions to run the big screen and all the TVs around the arena and social media. Olympia Entertainment President and CEO Tom Wilson told us they held nothing back. We've taken the best ideas from every building in the country, probably put it in one place, which is right here, and added so many innovations that people have never seen before. Here's a cool amenity. This is the Players Club. They even have a sign that marks it as such, but take a look behind me here. See the glass walls? Guess what happens while you're here eating and drinking? The players walk right through here to go to the locker room. Game so close, you can almost touch it. Here's the locker room, four times the size of the Joe. The wings have a practice rink that will double as an amateur kids hockey facility that even has study rooms. There are 60 suites with luxury everything. There are 20,000 very comfortable seats, 3,000 more in the lower bowl than the Joe. The Pistons will have 21,000. So the only thing left to do is to finish the restaurants here inside Little Caesars Arena. They figure that'll take four days, which will be two days ahead of when Kid Rock does his best to try and lift the lid off of this place. In downtown Detroit, Rod Maloney, Local 4. All right, Rod, there's one impressive amenity they couldn't show us today. They call it the Jewel Skin. It is a wall on the upper bowl that will have projection screens playing the game 10 stories high. Mm. So you don't miss anything when you leave your seats. I Just love that idea in case you're waiting in line. Yeah. I wonder what the players think about that pass through. Kind of being like a little goldfish <laughs> the there aquarium. where everyone can yeah, see them. That's right. Uh, home security cameras help capture crooks. But they also catch some pretty cool things. New here at 530 with this camera caught that turned night into day. And we aren't talking about a UFO. Also, it may just be the most important check in this hotel clerk ever did. What is secretly happening in this video that may have just saved a woman's life. And what happens to babies and children when their parents are struggling with opioid addiction? My special report is right after the break. Stay with us. I teach. New at six. I'm Mara McDonald. Illegal dumping in the city of Detroit has been a problem for decades, but tonight those dumpers all of a sudden are finding themselves on city's candid cameras. Talk to any driver in Michigan, they'll tell you auto insurance rates are too high. But are they higher for women just because they're women? All right, Steve, now to the innocent victims of America's opioid crisis, babies and children who can't help themselves now caught in the middle of this cycle of addiction. Babies and children who suffer because of their parents' addiction. Our Kimberly Gill joins us now live from our local four phone bank. And Kim, this problem is becoming more and more widespread. Yeah, it really is. Uh, Karen and Devin, uh, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But first, I want to let you know I'm in the local four phone bank with experts from Families Against Narcotics, Brighton Center for Recovery, Detroit Wayne Mental Health Authority, and Oakland Community Health Network. They are taking your questions until 630 tonight and then again during our special report, which will air at 10 p.m. You can call the number on your screen. That number is 844-93. 8435 or 844 WDIV help. Now, as you were saying, Karen, a big concern with this opioid crisis is how children are affected when their parents are suffering from this addiction. It's very emotional <clears throat> and I cry a lot up here. Pat Jordan cares for babies who are suffering. We just let them know it's going to be okay. She volunteers inside a neonatal intensive care unit at an Orlando hospital. The babies are born with neonatal abstinence syndrome caused by opioid addiction. The mom system absorbs the opioids and then it gets into the babies and the babies then have to go through what's very similar to a withdrawal. It's a very real problem in Michigan. The Department of Health and Human Services says in 2014, 286 babies in Metro Detroit were born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. The cases are easy to track because hospitals must report any suspicion of substance abuse. We're definitely seeing an increase in the number of children that are placed into foster care due to opioid 
addiction and dependency by their parents. The state agrees there is an increase and is launching a plan in October to track the actual number of opioid cases Child Protective Services is seeing. Right now, there is no system in place to do that. One of the things that I'm hopeful about there is that as we get better data and we use data to help inform better decisions, I think we'll be more effective in serving the families. Colin Parks manages Child Protective Services, the agency that investigates suspected cases of opioid abuse involving children. He encourages people to report any situations where they believe children are in danger. One of the things that we always try to do as a department is recognize that the best place for a child is with their parent whenever it's safe to do that. And so the hope would be that, you know, the, the cases that really were high risk, intensive risk, will get the services they need. And that may be out of home placement. It may not be. Maria Lesnaw runs Guiding Harbor in Belleville. She's seen the worst case scenarios where parents can no longer care for their children because of this addiction. Can you try to help me to understand what these kids are faced with and what they've gone through. So oftentimes these children have been, you know, the caretaker of the family. They're trying to, you know, care for themselves or their siblings and really take charge of a household at times. We've had children that have been abused, neglected, sexual abuse, and they're, they're not really um, able to express themselves when they first come in because, you know, you're taught in families that you need to protect your family. And so a lot of times children don't tell the truth right away. Yeah, and Park says less than 5% of all cases they see, including those involving opioids, never get to the court system and even less end up with children being taken from the home. Lesna says more foster parents are needed and they try to keep these children with relatives when possible, but it's not always the case. Also head to click on Detroit.com where we have a special opioid nation resource page about this epidemic. Uh, you can see all of our reports there. People are also sharing their stories of addiction and so much more. But it is just heartbreaking seeing those little babies, you know, there's just just okay. needing to be held while they go through this yep. awful withdrawal. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Mm -hmm. The home security camera captured the moment of a lifetime as a meteor flying over Canada just burst into flames. Meteor lit up the evening sky Monday night over parts of British Columbia and Alberta. Uh, officials received dozens of calls from people who reported seeing a mysterious bright light followed by a loud boom. Well, Jake Polson's home security camera recorded that impressive sight. The American Meteor Society is calling this a fireball, which is uh, basically a very bright meteor.